Thank you. I grew up in rural Cornwall in the 1970s, and my memories back then, other than the horizontal rain and gale force winds, which used to bend me over double in those gales, are largely about food. And I'm sure if you think about your own childhoods, you're thinking about the same things. I'm thinking about marathon bars, but that's because I'm 103. You may think of them as Snickers. But whatever it is you're thinking about, you're probably feeling this warm glow. Because we all emote about food. Food is far more than just calories. It's about feeling looked after. It's about feelings of love. And that's really, really important. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, a little bit later. But before we get ahead of ourselves, there was another real universal truism back in the 1970s when I was growing up. And that's we all ate around the dining table. Today, in the United States, one in three of all meals are eaten in cars. I'll say that again. One in three meals in the United States are eaten in cars. Now, you've gasped. Things aren't actually that much better here. So here in the UK, the average UK adult spends five hours a week watching food programs, reading those Sunday supplements, maybe reading the latest best-selling book, maybe even tagging social media about food. Five hours doing that. But we only spend, on average, four hours actually cooking food, preparing food. Now, four hours sounds quite a lot, but you divide that across seven days, you're under half an hour, and divide that through three meals, and you're under 10 minutes. So we're spending less than 10 minutes a meal preparing food. And some of you are gasping about, you know, Americans eating in cars. So you could say, what well, does this matter? You know, where are we coming from with this? Well, food started to industrialize um, after the Second World War. People didn't come back from the trenches any great number, so we had to increase the amount of um, food production. And that was done using some of those techniques of feeding the soldiers in the trenches. You could argue it goes back even further than that, actually, from the time of the Industrial Revolution, um, when men and women left the countryside and went into the cities and needed to be fed in a different way. But actually, food has a really, really direct impact on our landscape, uh, far more than perhaps you'd imagine. So if we think about those rolling green fields of England, they're there because of sheep and cows. The UK has the most incredible climate. It's not too hot, though last week was really warm, but it's generally not too hot. It's generally not too cold either, and it rains an awful lot. And we all know that. It's really, really wet. That is perfect if you want to grow grass, and we do that incredibly well. But also, food is really, really instrumental on our built environment. So we think about our archetypal high street. There it is, and it's there because of food. It's there because we used to, and I do say the word used to, we used to shop in the butchers, the bakers, and the greengrocers. And we're losing that now, because actually we're now choosing to shop online and shopping at those out-of-town superstores. So food has a real impact on our built environment. There is a really, really neat shorthand to think about food and industrialization. And that is about the level of English spoken. Wherever English is spoken as a first language, so here, the United States, when I speak to my colleagues in Australia and New Zealand, there's really, really industrial food. It's pretty bad for us. And where there are increasing amounts of English being spoken, then up goes the diabetes, up goes the childhood obesity. In fact, you can look at maps of places like China and the former Eastern Bloc countries where they all start to speak English, so up goes the obesity. And it directly correlates. So many of you here are speaking English as a second language. I implore you, stop, otherwise you're going to be diabetic. <laughs> You've got to stop doing this. So, <laughs> yeah, you must stop. So, why, why is this so? Well, we're told there is no other way. In the UK, we import 40% of all the food that we eat. 40%. And that will give you pause for thought um, if we're thinking about Brexit. We're not going to talk about Brexit too much, if at all, after this. But 40% of all the food that we eat um, is imported. 50% of all that food, and that's all pretty much made here, is ultra-processed. And if you want a really good example of ultra-processed, think about super noodles. They're about as good as it gets. But 50% of all our food is ultra-processed. Yet, if we look at those southern European countries where the culture is very, very different, we're looking at 13%, 14%, 15%. Um, Portugal has the lowest. So... Does it, again, does this matter? Does it really matter if we're eating really ultra-processed food? Well, we know it's not good for us. And why do we know? Well, even the manufacturers are telling us it's not particularly good for us. 
So I've got this wonderful product here. It's like show and tell. I've got this great product here. And the manufacturer says you should enjoy it. Yes, you should enjoy it no more than once a week. But I've got this other one here, which is different. So we can enjoy this the next day, can't we? Because this one is different to this one. And yeah, we la you know, yeah, and I laugh at this too. But when I go out into the community, and I'm really privileged because I go out into the community a lot and meet lots of people, people really do think these are different. And the great thing with this company, and I'm singling them out, but there are lots of others who do the same. The great thing with this company is they produce more than seven varieties. So you can eat a different one every day of the week, <laughs> still enjoying each one no more, enjoying it no more than once a week. So does it really matter? Again, I mean, I keep asking that question, that rhetorical question to myself, does this really matter? We know we shouldn't be eating it. It's fine if we've only eaten it on Monday, because on Tuesday we're going to have the other one. Does that really matter? Does it really matter that we only um, produce 60% of our food? Well, what happens when we start to offshore? What happens when we, you know, uh, take, um, um, sorry, what happens when we move our food production overseas? Well, this. I love this map. This map is, I think, the coolest map. Um, and what I do is I often take this into schools. Um, and these green dots are growing wheat in the Saudi Arabian desert. So it's a satellite image. This is from NASA. This thing is absolutely vast. So imagine growing wheat in one of the driest places in the world. Now, to be fair, wheat originally did come from the Middle East, but not the kind of wheat that we, that we produce now. Um, and in the late 1990s, 1997, Saudi Arabia was the third largest exporter of wheat in the world from the desert. Third largest exporter of wheat in the world. And they did that because oil prices were incredibly high. So what they did is they said, well, we've got lots and lots of oil. We don't have too much other industry. Let's grow wheat. And that seemed a really good idea. So they decided to pump all the water out of the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the sorry, out of the water table in the desert um, to produce wheat, because wheat is really, really thirsty, which is why it grows really well here. Wheat is like grass. We have great grass because it's not too hot, not too cold, and it rains a lot. So what did that do for economics? Well, the Saudi government, to make this viable, had to, um, had to give subsidy four times the spot price than British and European and Canadian farmers. So what happened is the price of wheat collapsed. This wheat came onto the market. And where did it go? Well, it went into products like this. This is our contribution to the world. So after the Second World War, the United States and, and the Soviet Union were in an arms race, and they were developing nuclear weapons on the process called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. They thought they would kill everyone with their nuclear weapons. So if one let it off, then the other one would do so, and the world would die. Britain's contribution was this stuff. <laughs> now, we didn't let off any nuclear weapons, but we did. We did let this on the world. This is called the Chorley Wood Processed Bread. It was never particularly good, but after the quality of wheat in the 1970s died, it got even worse. So this stuff here, this is great. In, it's my inner child. You probably already guessed that. But anyway, take a slice of this, and if any of you have children or you've got nephews or nieces or cousins, just get a slice of this because actually like lots and lots of food, we pick this stuff up and we don't even realize we're doing it. So we pick it up and it feels kind of moist and then squeeze it and squeeze it. And I've only been doing this for about five seconds. My hand is wet. I don't know if you can see it glistening under the lights. But this stuff is marvelous because what you can do, any marks on your furniture, <laughs> sorry Warwick, but yes, it's really great. And if any of you are wearing makeup, because this fatty, watery liquid that comes out of this bread, which you're eating, by the way, is really, really great, you can take your makeup off with this. So if you've got any eyeshadow, I'll leave this here at the end for anyone who wants this. Don't get the crumbs in your eyes. But there is a serious point to it. Each slice of this is 150 calories. So a sandwich, you know, you might have a sandwich, 400 calories. You're wondering why we're getting fat. A sandwich may have a calorie content of 400 calories. 300 is coming from this, which is really good at taking marks off the, off the, um, off the table. So, bread. Lots and lots of our products, though, are being intensely produced from the great vast feedlots, which are producing cattle, maybe 10,000 head of cattle at a time um, in Nebraska, to production of almonds in California. California is now one of the driest places on Earth. 
yet most of our almonds from across the world come from there. They're exported right across. And they go into products like this, into our vegan skinny cappuccino latte or whatever that is. But anyway, I was given that on the train yesterday. I said, thank you very much. We'll bring that along today. But it's going into there. And to pollinate all of those almonds, it takes 50% of the entirety of the bees in the USA. Yes, 50% of all the bees have to be trucked across the USA. So they truck them from New York State all the way across to California, causing enormous stress, because actually what they want to do is they want to pollinate all of those almond trees at the same time. So we need to think about that the next time we're snapchapping our, our skinny cappuccino. But what we also need to think about is about thinking about hunger and how we farm, because actually what we're taught to, told very often is that actually our farming system at the moment is the only way to feed the planet. We're told that actually we're going to have 10 billion people by 2050. And how can we feed them? Well, we're told that this is the way. We're told this is the answer. We're told we can eat this once a week, so we're fine. We're not going to go hungry. That's a myth. Because actually most farming in, in the world is subsistence farming. Most farms are under a quarter of an acre. Here in the UK, the average farm is about 200 acres. In the US, 2,000 acres. In France, about 20 acres. But the norm is actually about a quarter of an acre. And they actually feed the world pretty well. Again, we have this conception that actually in developing countries, they're all hungry, and actually they're not doing very well, and actually this is a much better system. That is a myth. That is a myth. In developing countries, about 13.5% of people are hungry. Certain countries far more, other countries far less. Here in the West, using this system, this system producing this, 30% of people have too much food. But again, 13.5%, the same number who are hungry under the other system, are also malnourished. The Trussell Trust, our leading provider of food banks in the UK here, gave 1.3 million food parcels away last year. 1.3 million here in the UK. And this is a system apparently that feeds us really well, producing this. Half a million of those parcels went to children. Children are getting food parcels in one of the richest countries in the world. Yet, apparently, this is providing enough food for us. The all-party group on hunger, which is a parliamentary group, heard evidence that said in the school holidays, pupils who would normally be on free school meals but who can't get them because they're on holiday. There is no food system in school holidays. And if mum and dad don't have the income to provide them with good quality food, for every week of school holiday, one week rollback in attainment happens. Now, to put that in perspective, if the school holidays last just over 20% of the year because they get the six-week break in the summer and Easter and half-term and so forth, then that's a 20% rollback. So if you're in school from the age of 5 to 18 and you lose 20% of that, that's like not going to school for over three years. Is it any wonder that those young people are struggling? We're talking about the architects of tomorrow here today. How would you manage? How would you have got to where you are if you had effectively missed 20% of your schooling? Those young people have no opportunity to be the architects at all. We were the future. You may well be the future now, but they're the future tomorrow. And this is happening now. So what are the solutions? Well, the solutions perhaps aren't terribly sexy. Maybe you're coming to a TED Talk thinking I'm going to talk about hydroponics. Or maybe you think I'm going to talk about vertical farming. Or other kind of really kind of sexy new farming methods. And I'm going to ask you to pause on all of those. Because actually the first thing we can start to do is stop wasting food. We produce enough food and more today to feed all of the 10 billion that will be coming in 2050. All of them. And we'll all be fed really well. Enough food today already. That food, according to the UN, is worth $1 trillion in today's money. But we also need to tackle the other reasons of why people can't actually get involved in food. Why are they not connecting to food? And the organization that I work for, Slow Food, we do that. We go into the communities and we think about food. And one of the things we do is we run skills workshops. And the first thing we do is we teach people how to make a chocolate cake. That's probably not what you imagine that we would teach people, but everyone loves cake. I can see people in the front row smiling. You say the word cake and people smile. 
So cake is a good thing, and we should all say cake far more often. But cake is something that people emote to, and the very fact that we're producing lessons on cooking a cake means people come to us. If we started off saying we were going to cook oxtail or crispy pig's ear, maybe I'd go, but um, no one else is going to go to that. So we ran the session cooking chocolate cake. We've been running this now for nine years, and the first time we did this, we were incredibly naive. I was very naive. The organization was very naive. Yes, everyone liked cake, but there was a problem with cooking cake in the community. No one had cake tins. I have cake tins. Maybe some of you have cake tins. But actually, in the poorest communities, no one really has cake tins. So we now cook that chocolate cake in a saucepan. Because a saucepan, a metal saucepan, I should say, is a, is a cake tin with a handle. If you've got a plastic handle, don't do that. But a cake tin is a saucepan with a handle. And we cook that. And I went back the second week to see how the program was running. And a woman came up to me and she was crying. And I thought, gosh, what have we done? You know, cake is stable. You can't get poisoned from that. And she broke down in tears because she cooked her son a birthday cake. He was eight years old, and that was the first thing she cooked him. We talked about love earlier. Food is not just about calories. Food is about love and about protection and looking after people. And that really, really matters. And that empowered her. We can start buying food from people whose names we know and they know us. I don't mean badges saying, hi, I'm Shane, I'm here to help, when actually I'm not there to help at all. Buy food from people that you know. We also need to think about buying genuinely local food, food that supports our communities. And we also need to think about a, a concept which we call co-producer, which is a key thing within slow food. Every single thing that is on the shelf, it doesn't matter if it's in a farmer's market or in the branch of Sainsbury's, it doesn't matter what, that's been produced and is on the shelf because you were going to buy it. You were going to buy that, so you have been as instrumental in producing that item of food as the producer or the manufacturer. Buying food is a bit like voting. When I vote at the ballot box, my vote doesn't make the slightest bit of difference, nor does yours, actually. Not one vote. But collectively, we can change the food system. And sometimes we feel really, really powerless. But together, we can do this. We really can. So think about where you want your food system. Think about if you want animals and fields. Think about if you want green fields. Think about if you want a high street. Think about if you want little Johnny to have rollback of 20% in his schooling. Think about if we want the Trussell Trust to be feeding people. Because it doesn't need to be that way. We can do something different. We can slow the fork down. We can make our own pasta sauce. And you know, you can eat this more than twice a week. Thank you very much.